Hi, I'm Athena Paquette, real estate investor of more than 25 years. I'm so glad you found our real estate investing community. If you enjoy this video's investment tips, give us a thumbs up. That way, we know that you want more investment tips just like this. And don't forget to subscribe because if you subscribe, you'll be notified right away when we uh, upload a new real estate investing tips video. And lastly, don't forget to sign up for our exclusive monthly investment tips newsletter to learn even more about real estate investing. The link is in our video description below. So now let's get going to our newest real estate investing tips video. Hi, thanks for joining me. Um, as promised, I decided to do a couple of case studies on properties um, that we uh, saw and either decided to buy or not buy. And so the first one that I'm going to cover is one that came on the market, um, uh, I think last, I think it was Monday or Tuesday. Uh, this property at 1541 South Reisner Street in Indianapolis uh, came on the market. Um, you know, I saw it on the drip system, regular MLS drip system uh, that I'm on with Tyler Rennick, our realtor, one of our realtors in um, Indianapolis. I right away called him <clears throat> because I recognized it was um, an area that I know and uh, told him to make an offer. My text to him, I sent him an email uh, forwarded the drip system and said this one here and in caps in a text I said make offer now and so um, by two o'clock we had our offer in this property was listed at a hundred thousand it's a duplex it's a one bedroom one bath on each side and um listed for a hundred thousand. So we may, and they claim 15, 1550 in rents, uh, on these units. And so, um, I told them to make an offer right away. Often you don't get to know the nitty gritty of the numbers or anything till you make an offer. So if it's close, just make your offer. And because Tyler and many realtors in busy markets are busy, um, I want him to pay attention. So I, I text him make offer now. And so, and I put the price, the address, who the buyer is, so the LLC or my name or whatever. Um, and I usually send proof of funds. So, um, all, you know, all together, not in a text, but in the email, but I text him to make sure that he knows that this is a priority, like I in caps right now. So, um, so this one, uh, you know, before I did that, though, I did a little walk around to make sure on Google to make sure. Uh, it's where I, the property is where I think it is. Um, you know, looked at the neighborhood in this case, I didn't really have to, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, so again, one bedroom, one bath, each side, 1550 gross rents is what they're claiming. Um, and a price of a hundred thousand. So the next morning we got a counter offer for one Oh five. And I thought, do I really want to pay? That's like 5% more. Do I really want to pay 5,000 more? So I thought about it for a couple of hours um, and uh, talked it over with Tom and decided to, and uh, again, I'll cover why paying a little bit more was worth it. Um, but anyway, so today what I want to do with the case study is uh, walk through the numbers. So why did we decide to move forward with this? We're just now in inspections. So inspections are happening Tuesday. It may be that we back out, um, although Tyler did a walkthrough already and said it's in good condition. And you'll see by the pictures here uh, on your screen, just from Zillow, um, you can see that, you know, it's in pretty good condition, looks good, you know, on the outside, looks like there's some, maybe some problems with a little bit of cracks in the foundation, but not bad at all. I mean, it doesn't look like an, an issue. Um, so you've got, uh, you know, the bedrooms look in good condition, laundry room. So it looks like it's been recently remodeled. Um, another thing that I thought was a little telling that we'll find out soon enough is there are a lot of boxes in this room. So did these people just move in? I mean, look at the kitchen has boxes. So we'll see what the deal is with that. And then obviously there's a lot of grass in the picture. The grass is a little too tall to be able to see if there's a, a problem against the house or not and whether the, the water is going towards the house or away from the house. So there are obviously a lot of questions. Um, 
but this is how you start. So, so address is 1541 South Reisner. Um, so it's one bedroom, one bath each side. So the first thing, whoops, yeah, I probably shouldn't have done that. Uh, the first thing that I usually do is I look to see how long someone has owned a property. Um, and let me see if I can find that, uh, my property cards. Um, okay, let's open this up. Oh, shoot, I had all this open. Okay, so uh, so let's start with Rentometer since I can find that one. Uh, so Rentometer, I checked the rental comp. So they're saying they're getting seven seventy five per side if they're getting fifteen fifty, which is what they're saying per month. Um, so I plug in the address on Rentometer. I plug in whatever rent doesn't matter what you plug in because it's going to come up with answers anyway. Um, that it's a one bedroom, and I put any, but really you should put one bath. Um, it's going to look back 12 months and a radius search of two miles, which is too much. But um, in this case, you know, I just leave it alone. So the average rent for one bedroom in this area is 693. The median 625. The bottom quarter percentile is 577. The high is 808. And then they give you the kind of the average rent, you know, um, there. And then they give you the radius search. And so we want to stay really close to the subject property. So the subject property is over by Lily, uh, Lily's um, Recreation Park, the Lily, the uh, drug company. And so you're going to want to stay <clears throat> right around that area, you know, going way up here. That's a totally different neighborhood. So is this. Um, and I'm, I'm using my cursor. So if you're listening in, uh, there's things that cross the freeway, things that are way up by the river, totally different neighborhood. So we're going to stay with uh, the, the rental comps A, B, and D um, because they're in the Lily Technology neighborhood. Um, okay, so we've got 1751 West Minnesota. <coughs> Pardon me, that's a cross street to this, to this neighborhood. You can see it's 0.1 mile away. They are getting 635. Then 1805 Howard Street, um, a little more than a quarter mile away, they're getting 500 for an apartment, not a duplex, meaning they probably don't have any yard. Um, but each one of these on Rentometer, you can do a walk around for each neighborhood around each rental comp, which I think is really good. Um, and then you can also look at the property details, which I think is really important too. Then you've got 1535 Cap Street, and that's also a little more than a quarter mile away. They're getting 615. But if you just scroll down, all these ones that are closest um, are right around 600, right? Six, maybe 625. So you're thinking, why am I relying on 1550 total when that would indicate an, a total of 1200, which is still not bad if you're paying 105 for, uh, for a duplex. But what's not registered here is that Section 8 and a lot of government assistance programs go as high as 751 per month for a one bedroom because you're paying all utilities. So if you rent to a regular person, you're going to get regular rent. But if you get um, someone who's on some kind of government assistance, uh, like Section 8, Section 8 pays 751 for a one bedroom and pays 950 something, I think, for a two bedroom. So that's where you make more money. Um, to be cautious, you might want to do your numbers on the lower end of things. But in this case, they've already got the Section 8 renters in there. So I'm going to go ahead and use those numbers. Um, but just so you know, that's the difference. So that's our rent a meter uh, for our rental comps. Now, what we want to do is also look at the property card with the county. And I know I have that open somewhere. which bums me out because I got all this open ahead of time so we wouldn't have to delay things here. Uh, no, not that one. Uh, shucks. I may just have to reopen it. Okay, so let me just go to, I know one of them. Uh, here they all are. Okay. 
So we're going to first go to um, the title pro. So the, usually one of the things I do in my due diligence is look to see who owns the property, how much they might owe, uh, when they bought it, um, if there's recent uh, flips or transfers, meaning they shifted the property from one LLC to another or something like that. Uh, then I look for the square footage, the bedroom bath count, the lot size. So I look at all of that when I look on my title company or Title Pro 24-7 is um, um, an aggregator of information like that. So um, it's a great website tool to use. Uh, so here we have the address. I see here that the seller lives in Chicago. So he's not local. He's um, fairly local, but not. he doesn't live in Indianapolis, apparently. Now, his mailing address could be a business address. We don't know for sure, but this is somewhat of an indication. So it's a regular person. Justin Johnson owns it. And the recording date, meaning the last activity uh, with the county recorder, is 10 18 So that's probably when he bought it. We scroll down. He has a loan amount of 35000 that he took out back then. It indicates that there are three bedrooms. Interesting. Seven rooms, which includes living rooms, right? Uh, it does not have a bathroom count for some reason. Built in 1930. Now, this is interesting. It says the living area is 574 square feet. I found that to be a common error in uh, Marion County's records. Um and you'll see later, I pulled up the county card and it actually has more square footage than that. And then the lot size is indicated at 5619. Um, uh, and then, you know, construction type, you know, asphalt foundation is crawl or raised. Um, there's a partial basement. If there's a full basement, that actually could be good news because you could possibly rent that out or count it as another bedroom. Um and then the assessed year, okay, total assessed value. The assessed value and the market value are two different things, but this is what the property tax is based on is assessed value. Um, so tax year 2019, 2019 their, their property tax amount was 831. Well, that's because they bought it for, um, if we scroll down here, they bought this property, uh, it doesn't say here, I found that somewhere that, he bought it for <clears throat> 43000 So his tax bill is 2% of that 43000 Our tax bill will increase someday, maybe, up to the 2% of the 105 we're paying. So I count that higher level, although you could get away with the lower tax bill for years before the county reassesses you. Um, unfortunately, there were no comps found. Um, so all we have here is just the record of the... Uh, the different transfer dates. So he does have a loan on it. So what if he had a loan for say, I don't know, 150,000, I would know that there's an issue possibly in closing, but because his loan is well, well below the price, I know he should be able to close uh, without any problems with um, doing a short sale or something like that. Um, okay. So these are interesting records to look back on. I mean, it's interesting to see who owned it before and so on, but that's all the information we can glean from the title record. Now, if we go over to the property card, so this is, um, you'll, you'll get a screen like this. Uh, it says, so you go on to uh, ND.gov and you can actually just save this assessor pro property cards is the uh, forward slash. Um, and then you can either search by parcel number um, by state parcel number, which is a different number, or the address. I often mostly use the address. So I type in the address, 1541 South Reisner Street, and this property card comes up, or that link comes up, which gives me the property card. So this is what the county has. So um, kind of similar information, Justin Johnson, his mailing address, uh, the subdivision the property is in, which is called Pleasant Bonds Edition, um, let's see what else. It gives you your map page, your parcel number, property class, tax district, the neighborhood number. So all of that. And it says officially this is 1541 South Reisner. So sometimes you'll see a duplex will have both addresses on there. Sometimes it'll say A and B. Uh, and sometimes it just, it's just known as one address, right? Um, but you always want to make sure that they recognize it as a two-family home. In other words, they may 
it may be a house that got split, right? So this is part of what you're verifying is that it's legally a duplex. So here it's property subclasses, residential, two flat family plotted lot. And I don't know what 620 means. Okay, then we've got your transfer of ownership records. So uh, MLR Paramount sold it to our gentleman October of 2018. Before that, um, in June, Robert McAdams owned it, which could be that that's MLR, right? We don't know if Mr. McAdams is maybe the same. Uh, but we do see that the sale amount was 45000 So our, our seller that we're buying from paid 45000 for this property and looks like he remodeled it from what the pictures look like. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Then they give you the breakdown of the valuation or how they came up with the value for taxation. Uh, so, you know, in 2019, it was worth in their eyes 35, then 35, and then 2021, they bump or 36, I guess, in 2020, and then 47,000 in 2021. So then we're going to scroll down and we're going to go to uh, the property sketch. So first they're saying it's a row type property. Now, why it's not checked off as a duplex, I don't know, but we saw up up there that the, they did recognize it as a two family residence. It's a one story property. There's no attic. So they kind of give you some parameters here. Um, but most importantly is the sketch of the property. So you've got a little patio balcony something here, but the inside of the property is 1148 square feet, which makes sense that the 574 would be about double that, right? So, um, so in this case, it is double. So we have two sides of the duplex. Each has 574 square feet, which is, you know, a fair size for a one bedroom. Now, if it said three bedrooms, I would be concerned. Two bedrooms is tight, but possible. But this kind of makes sense. Um, let's see. And then that they, they do say that the exterior feature of a porch is there. Um, and then it tells you what kind of construction is, uh, you know, the, the size or area. So they kind of give you some parameters here and the improved value and then another sketch. So that's what you get from the county record. You're just verifying that what you think it is seems to be true according to the county. If there's a discrepancy, um, I recommend calling the county and asking them. It's fine to say, I'm looking at buying this property. This is what I found. What do you show? Because uh, they have more records than just this, obviously, right? They have all the records of all the improvements ever done. If you ever want to see the uh, permits for a property over time, um, I recommend going to permit permit permitreports.com um, because you can pull permits on any property across the nation um, if you have your uh, if it's questionable as to what's there. Right. Um, okay. So we went through the rental comps. We went through the property. Is it what we think it is? Uh, now let's look at the numbers and the comps, the recent sales comparables are hard in this neighborhood because so much is being remodeled, but I am waiting for sales comps. Uh, but just to give you an example, uh, two years ago, we bought a property down the street, way down the street, uh, I would say four or five blocks down the street. And that one is a three bedroom, two bath on each side. We paid 126. So property values have come up a lot in 2020, as we know. Um, so I just want to see, but we're going to get an appraisal. So as far as the true value in this case, the next case that I do with you uh, on a rehab is not, not is going to be different. But on this one, because it's in good condition, we're going to get an appraisal. I'm just going to wait to see what the appraisal says as far as is it worth what we're paying. Um, the numbers seem to indicate it is, but um I just got to change this because we switched to 25% down. Okay, so th this is just to walk you through the numbers and what we can change and what we cannot change, right? So our price here is $105,000. Our down payment is $26,250. Our closing costs are $4,500. Typically, they're $2,500, but I include a fill fee for the new uh, property usually. In this case, they have both sides filled, so I could probably lower that. Um, 
because I have quite a big buffer there. So if you're buying a, a vacant a duplex, you're going to pay $500 per side to fill them. And then, of course, it takes about a month to get that cash flow going. So it's good to have a buffer no matter what. Oh, if you do imp- an impound account, that's going to push it up. So $4,500 for your closing costs and imp- new impound account or escrow account uh, is probably a good number anyway. Okay, so your total investments thirty thousand seven fifty. Total cost, meaning the price plus all your closing costs, is one hundred nine five. Okay, so and those numbers will be important later when we're calculating our return. Okay, so we have two one bedroom one bath units. They're both rented for seven seventy five. Maybe it's seven fifty. Um, but remember, they told me or they told us that the, it's rented for fifteen fifty a month. So if that comes in a little lower, we're going to have to adjust our numbers because I do believe they're getting $750 per side, not uh, $775. So that's a total rent of $1550. Now, you might want to do the lower rent for a a non-Section 8 person. You might want to have that. Usually, I have the pro forma low here and the pro forma high here. So I could redo that and see how my numbers look. But for this situation, I I decided to keep it a little bit simpler than having too many numbers in there. So my $1,550 per month um, after vacancy is about $1,400. It's actually $1,395, but I just wanted to make the numbers kind of round. Then in this section, we have our financing section so we can figure out not only our cap rate, which is with no financing, of course, right? Your NOI divided by your price. Um, But then I also want to figure out my cash on cash return or return on equity to know, okay, you know, I only have 30,000 into this, not 109,000. So what is my return then? Okay, so that's a very short section. So our expenses. So first of all, we're going to pay 10% management. You might pay 9% or 8%. um, But in this case, we use 10% of the net rent after vacancy. So you don't pay a management fee if there's no rent coming in. Just like if a tenant is uh, past due or not paying, you don't pay a management fee unless the rent is collected, okay? So in this case, 10% of the 1,400. Now we could have made it 10% of the fully occupied with no vacancy. We could do that, especially if you review the, um, if you review the, the leases and these properties just got rented, then most likely you're gonna get a year of income, right? So. Um, keep that in mind that you could do your numbers on that, but you want to always make sure that you've got um, something in there in case the property is vacant. So we've got our management fee of 1400. I mean, 14, I mean the management fee of 10% of the rents collected. Then the property tax I mentioned earlier, I'm going to use 2% of the, the price we pay. So say $2,000 divided by uh, 12. So 161 a month for the, for the tax bill. However, the tax bill currently was, I think we saw 853. So really it's, you know, it's really going to be more like $80 per month until, or $75 per month until the county catches up with us. So, um, but again, worst case scenario is what I'm headed for, not the rosy picture, right? And then uh, homeowner's insurance or hazard insurance, you're going to call your agent the minute you make an offer, just so you know uh, what the ballpark is for the insurance. And this depends on your deductible. So if you get a deductible of, say, $5,000, your rent is, I mean, your insurance policy is going to be very cheap. Um, I got quotes on this one already, obviously, because I've been in escrow for two, three days. So I'm starting to get all my information together, ordering the inspections, ordering the, the, uh, the, uh, plumbing company to go uh, do a camera camera inspection. So uh, so the hazard insurance um, in this case was if I wanted a thousand dollar deductible, they wanted 1600 a year, which is more like 140. If I was willing to do a $2,500 deductible, it was 1300 a year. And if I did a $5,000 deductible, it was going to be, um, I want to say 11 something. So in this case, I chose the 12 something per year, the $1,300. So let's just change this. See, this is new information, even since I did this a few days ago. Okay. 
So then uh, there's no flood insurance. So here we're paying all utilities. That's one of the things you want to always double check is whether the landlord or the tenant is paying utilities because uh, that makes a huge difference in your cash flow, obviously. And when you're comparing rents, um, you know, if you're paying utilities, you're getting a higher rent than someone who's not paying utilities. So rental comps are tricky. And, and listen to what I'm saying about this. You want to double check to see if you're paying just because the rental comp may not be paying utilities and might be low, real low compared to what you can get when you, you know, go all in, pay all in utilities. So in this case, it's a one bedroom, one bath on each side. So I might be high on this water and garbage, but I did $150 per month for that and then $30 for electric. Electric in Indy is cheaper than gas. So if you can get all electric uh, um, appliances, that's actually better. Here in California, our gas is pretty cheap too. Um, and our electric's expensive. It's the opposite there in Indianapolis. Um, and then the gardener. So the gardener is going to be something like $40 twice a month, but only during the months where the grass is growing aggressively, you know, because of rains and all that. So usually six to seven months out of the year, you're paying for the gardener. So take that, we'll call it $80 a month times seven months, we'll say. I did six months in this case, but let's just say seven months. Um, so that's, uh, what is that, 560 divided by 12. So uh, to do, because this is all your monthly budget, right? Uh, then if there's septic maintenance or well maintenance or anything like that, then I've got maintenance reserves. So that's, you know, to <clears throat> pay for things as they come up. So a screen door breaks, uh, the plumber has to go out uh, to snake something or unclog something. Maybe, um, I don't know, there's all kinds of little things that can come up. Typically, if it's in good condition, you would just do $50 per side. Um, so $150, again, I'm being a little aggressive, but I wanted to, uh, until I find out what condition this is really in, uh, I'm going to leave that there. However, um, and it could be that it'll get replaced by something else, um, but this property has been rehabbed. We saw by the pictures, it's in good condition. Um, so it's, I'm, I'm not likely to see high expenses with this, but, but we'll see. So that gives me total expenses of $786 per month. Uh, and so my NOI is that $1,400 minus the $786. So I'm left with $614 per month in net income, right? So what if I, uh, what if I went to $80 on the tax bill? And what if I said, oh, you know what? This is a new property. We only need $50 a month for stuff like that, Re not rehab, but, you know, upkeep, maintenance. So then I'd have an NOI of 795. So I've increased my, my, my return, my cap rate by 2% just by doing those things. Um, so you can give yourself a very rosy picture. I could even uh, take out the maintenance altogether, um, but I leave them in just to give me a realistic number. Now, one of the things that I recommend is people have um, a reserve account for repairs. Um, the reason that is, is the first year you buy a property, all the things that will come up do come up. So, for example, you don't know, and neither does your manager know, um, <clears throat> what kind of wear and tear is behind the walls, um, what kind of tenants these people are. Do they damage things a lot or do they, are they, uh, you know, not damage it, but are, are they, you know... Uh, you know, going through filters a lot or they, you know, there's all kinds of things that, that can happen with a tenant uh, because they're, 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 for example, Section 8, they may not be working a regular job, so they may be home a lot, so their utilities will be higher. So we don't know till we get into it, um, but, uh, but this is a starting point with your numbers, right? Once you have a year with the property, you can tweak your numbers better. So yeah, unfortunately you're like, Hey, no, I want to know for real what my numbers are for sure, for sure. So I can plan and I can, you know, know what my return is. The thing is, is it's hard to, it's hard to gauge those things with no track record, right? Um, you can ask the seller for historical bills, 
bring in. The problem is, is if these tenants have just moved in, uh, for example, our seller bought the property in 2018, there may not be very good records if, if they had it rented, then got rid of the people and rehabbed it and then, you know, have just recently rented it. So we have to take our best guess at all these expenses. Okay. So for example, what's not in here? If you have an LLC, you're paying for your LLC renewal every year in um, Marion County or Indiana. It's uh, $350 per year to register your LLC. <clears throat> so there's certain things that are not in there. Oh, back to the repair reserves. So I recommend people have two to 3000 on a smaller property like this, maybe 3000 set aside for repair reserves. So if you have the cash set aside, you would put it in your um, acquisition costs, right? As setting up a reserve account, which means you're not going to have it as an ongoing expense. So um, let's just, and I just want to demonstrate how this works. So right now, based on what I have, we have a cap rate of 6.73, which is not bad for a property that's in good condition. It's a little low for what we'll call a B minus C neighborhood, which this, this neighborhood near Lily is. Um, so, um, so let's just look what happens now to the 6.73. If I say, you know what, we're not going to do, we're not going to budget monthly for these repairs. We are going to put them in our cash to close. Um, let's just put it in the, uh, in this category, the repairs. Okay. So my, my cap rate is 8.15 because I have cash set aside as opposed to dipping into the monthly cash flow. So this is something you can do. Um, and I recommend having a cash set aside for this anyway, because there are incidentals that come up. Um, but you, you know, to have clean books, Right. I like clean books, especially as you build your portfolio, much easier to have a cash set aside for each uh, individual property. And then the budget works better that way than if you're, you know, let's say one month, 150 is not enough for the repair. Then you're putting money in uh, and then you're catching up the next month. It gets a little messier when you do it, uh, pay for things through cash flow. Um, although it's intuitively probably <laughs> you're thinking it's a better thing. So if we, um, if we have our NOI of 764, we are then $764 per month minus our mortgage payment. Remember 387.40 was going to be the mortgage payment. So now when we minus that out from the cash flow, we have 376 per month in our pocket. So 376 per month uh, times 12 divided by our initial investment. So um, let's just make sure. Uh, let's see here. So 376.60 times, whoopsie, times 12 is 45.19. So that's that number there that you see to the right of the 376 or under underneath also. So 4519 is our annualized cash on cash return divided by our initial investment of now we have 33,000 because I included the cash reserves for repairs. So our 4500 divided by our 33,000 means we're making 13.39% return on this duplex if all this is true. So this is how we start uh, with our numbers. Then once we're in escrow, we get the rental agreements. I'm definitely going to want to see the whole rental file. Just I want to see who the tenants are. Are they getting government assistance? All that kind of thing. Because when it's a new tenant, you want to see what kind of tenant they're going to be or try and extrapolate just because there's no history, right? If they're new tenants, there's no last year's management report to show how well it went with these people or the year before for that matter. So when they are new tenants, you want to make sure that you get to see the file, the application and everything. How did they pick these tenants? You can't unpick them, but you can certainly have your manager be on guard um, as to what kind of tenant got let into this property. Right. Um, 
Okay, so besides uh, looking at that, so we looked at the MLS, we did a walkthrough of the neighborhood property. Um, we looked at income expenses pro forma because we don't know, we're, we're just using our formulas, right, till we get the real deal. Uh, recent sales, I was not able to get quickly enough for this meeting, but the recent sales um, will come soon enough. And if not, like I said earlier, we're going to get a formal appraisal in a few days. So if it doesn't appraise, we can go back to the seller and say, you know, we have to lower the price because, but the market is so hot. And there were multiple offers on this property. Most likely, if it's within 10000 we probably will just pay the difference, right? We'll just make it up. Um, we looked at the property card to make sure the square footage, the unit mix. We made sure that uh, the city thinks it's a duplex like we think it's a duplex. Um, and we will find out why the title records show that it's a three-bedroom it's possible that it's a two bedroom, one bath on one side and a one bedroom, one bath on the other. That would be great. Um, a value add thing would be if there's enough space or if the, if the layout of the property is good enough, you can maybe squeeze another bedroom in there. Um, so there's lots of potential, but we want to verify all the facts. And whenever there's a discrepancy, we want to know, is it a dis discrepancy to the bad or is it a discrepancy to the good for us, right? Um, and we saw the lot size. We verified that the square footage is indeed 1,100 square feet and not 574 for the entire property, which would have been something. Um, okay, so, so, so those are the numbers. I mentioned earlier, why would we be willing to overpay for this property? Um, and the reason is, is we own the property right next door. So we own... 1530 or at home in Indy LLC owns the property right next door at 1537 slash 1539. Remember this one's 1541. And so there's value in me being able to have the property right next door <clears throat> to control uh, damage between the properties, uh, problems between tenants. You know, if you have two different owners of buildings, one person may manage their, their property really well and the other neighbor owner may not. And so by owning this one, we control both properties and therefore we can have uh, some order, some, some rules in place. We can, we'll say, limit the um, damage to our tenants' uh, lifestyle. In other words, our tenants... Uh, could be affected by someone mismanaging their property. So by having both properties, we control a little bit of that damage and actually can enhance, enhance the, uh, you know, the, um, I keep saying lifestyle, but the livability or the enjoyment, the, the enjoyment to our tenants. Also, there could be synergies and expenses. So the two uh, backyards are, Together, there's no fence, in fact, between those two backyards. It's just one big open open space. Um, and so, you know, the mowing of the lawn, the, uh, the cleaning up of the yard, that's another thing. One, one owner might have let all kinds of garbage build up in a backyard right next door to property we own where we're maintaining that yard so or maintaining the debris. So... Um, and if we put a fence around the property, we can put a fence around the entire property. So um, it's much more effective that way. So there's a lot of uh, synergies, controls um, that that are that are that can come out of this, and that's why it was worth it when I was debating over going up five more thousand dollars on this duplex. Um, that was one of the clinchers. Is that yeah? I want to be able to control what goes on. And the you know minimize expenses by having the entire lot, uh, two lots. So, so that's why we decided to move forward, even though I didn't really want to pay extra for this property. So you're probably wondering, well, Athena, what if you can't get uh, seven fifty or seven seventy five? So let's just say we get the normal six fifty for a one bedroom over there, or six twenty five even. Okay, so 10%, uh, I got to put my formula back in here, so 1170. So now, um, so now my cap rate's down to 5.9, my cash on cash returns only 6%.
So this property is only worth what it's worth because of the cash flow that it that it produces, right? Um, although there are there are happy things about having both properties side by side, um, it may not be worth it to have both if uh, the rents really are six fifty. So. You're probably wondering, well, how do you know? So I called my uh, new property manager, some of you know PMI Indy, um, and asked the, um, the owner, I haven't been able to talk to the leasing agent yet, but the owner said definitely for a one bedroom, you get six, I mean, 751 if you're doing a section eight, which it seems that's what they've done. And he said, there's plenty of section eight people uh, wanting to rent over there. So we're in good shape as far as re-renting it for that price. Um, so hopefully that was helpful. Um, let me know if there's any other kind of numbers you'd like me to cover when I'm doing these case studies. Um, the next one I'm going to do for you is the rehab one with the cracked foundation that we're also under contract for. I'm going to walk you through those numbers. Um, but for now, this is the end of the 1541 South Risener near the Eli Lilly uh, Park, Recreational Park. And um, looks like it's probably going to be a good one for us. And uh, I will definitely update you as we have our meetings on how this this project in particular is going. And um, I look forward to seeing you guys on our next call. I'm going to just stop sharing a little bit here. So I look forward to seeing you guys on our next call. Have a great weekend. Bye. Thank you for watching our video. I hope you liked the content. And if you did, be sure to like and subscribe our channel. See you soon.